The stage is set. The accused, the accursed, strong-armed, shuffled from stockade, from quarters, to the largest common area in the Phoenix Project. Collapsible walls to the left and right are gone. Makeshift stadium seating surrounds the room's center. Antiquated plywood is erected to corral suspects, sympathizers. Before the oversized prisoner's dock, large LED screens flicker. Electricians and technologists test glowing screens, sending computer-generated imagery, bubbles, blending colors, sparks from screen to screen. Expressionist images move, congeal, disappear to dust. Nearby, microphones and thin line cables stretch about the room. Expressionless men in black t-shirts tap, cough, speak into each. Testing, one, two, three. Testing. Amplified baritones boom around the hall. Outside the expansive room, citizen pushes citizen. They shove, squirm to get closer to the entrance, the action. Some seek other ways to access the trial, thinking, if we see the faces, expressions, gestures, we will know who is guilty, who is a scapegoat, who must suffer punishment. Elsewhere, older citizens, the disabled, parents, children, wait. Huddled around old, globe-like screens, families anticipate the closed-circuit transmission. They gobble edible but expired sweets and globs of plant matter. They exchange glances. None say a word. After all, what if the spectacle is all part of some greater experiment, some other investigation? Pit Creative Group presents Aftermath, Episode 35, Black Mirror. John Bath and Miral Ganaya amble into the main hall. Their prestige as professional, required citizens gives them greater access. Other citizens glance, glimpses of recognition. Eyes scan, see John's black armband prominently displayed. John ignores their stares, seeks the faces of Danielle Devenu, project administrator, his mentor, Catherine Rand, Major McGillicuddy, Donna's not coming, Ganaya states matter-of-factly, referring to the engineer working furiously in the project's laboratory. Maybe she's watching this farce on a screen, John says, as they push past a group huddled around the side of a row of bleachers. Doubt it? Muriel's voice is low, so as to not draw attention. She nods slightly at the front of the crowd. There's Danielle. John turns, sees the beautiful project administrator taking a seat rows in front of them. Bath turns slightly. She looks... He does not finish his statement. A wave of spectators force John and Mural to the center of the stands. John hesitates to sit. Close proximity to so many others, his fellow citizens, colleagues, students, disturbs him. A strain of anxiety crawls his spine and skin. Mural sits. John glances down at her. He takes a breath in, out. What the hell is happening, he thinks. Then he takes his seat. Mural leans close to John. Have you seen the general? John looks around. Is he here? I haven't seen him for days, Mural replies. Cuddy either, John says. Our last interaction was awkward. Mural arches an eyebrow. 
Yeah, Bath continues, crosses his arms in front of him. Said something about Colonel Marsh. Said she disappeared. Something about a warrant. I'm not sure I understood. Bright umbrella lights illuminate the floor, the corral where prisoners will stand. Screens at the back of the room flicker to life, emanating a solid but discernibly black image. One has to wonder, Mural says, how much electricity, how much this is taxing the project's diminished resources. No one cares, Bath says under his breath. The words are scarcely out of his mouth before he feels a tap at his elbow. At first, John is annoyed. Then, he shifts to see the psychotherapist, Dr. Charles Fox. Bath? Fox offers his hand. John is taken back a moment. He remembers the unusual occasion in which he last saw his colleague. Charles? Fox looks down at John's arm, sees the black armband. Solidarity? He asks. John exhales hard, unsure how much he wants to get into it with the other man. Fox turns, looks forward, scanning the room. I hope you're not planning on making a public scene. Ganaya leans closer so she can hear the two over the cacophony of loud conversation and hushed whispers of the crowd. You're not suited for it, Fox tells Bath. John's eyes narrow. I saw you the other day, at the stockade. He stares at the side of the bearded man's red face. Yes, I should have thanked you, I suppose. Fox leans his shoulder to John. That little plea you made freed the women and children, at least temporarily. Couldn't help but notice she retrieved that little girl. Fox nods. Yes, Triana. She's a patient of mine. A very, very special patient. I didn't know you treated minors, Charles. Fox looks right at Bath. In the last year or so, as anxiety, conflict have increased, I treat everyone, more patients than I've ever had. I've mostly ended my clinical work, just therapy now. It's getting worse, John adds. Yes, Fox agrees. Yes, it is. Suddenly, the entrances on the left and right of the room are filled with a cadre of law enforcement personnel and volunteers. The column of prisoners on the left is led by Corporal Reed. The other column of men and women in shackles and cuffs is led by Lieutenant Baker. Each row includes dissident suspects. Angry shouts erupt throughout the room. Voices of discontent follow. Mural senses, feels John's anger, sees the line between his green eyes, crow's feet she never noticed before. Mural places a hand on John's right forearm. Don't, she speaks sincerely. Did Danielle tell you to watch me? He asks. There are other ways you can help your friends without joining them, John. Bath turns. You've always been a dutiful pawn, Meryl. His words are hard, intentionally mean. You do what the council, what the damned computer tells you to do. What are you prepared to do? Meryl's blank expression softens into a smile. You are cruel, John, because you can't help it when logic escapes you, when your self-professed objectivism and reason are at conflict or odds with what you feel. But the truth is, Bath, John, you know little about other people, what they feel. You think you know everyone's motives and ambitions. You've been trained to think of human beings in terms of philosophy and politics, but you don't know anything. Meryl leans closer sees John's instinct is to shift. She likes that. I'm a physician, John. I've devoted my life to healing people, flesh and blood, bone and matter. There's a bigger crisis here, a global set of stakes. Meryl gestures cautiously at the crowd. She looks to her left, right, fixes her calm gaze on the law enforcement volunteers waving the prisoners into the dock. John turns, looks at Fox, then back at Ganiah. But what the hell does that leave? How can I do nothing if... Don't do nothing, Meryl speaks softer, her lips close to Bath's ear. She withdraws a little. Move forward. After that, Ganaya ignores the academic and explorer, focuses her observation on the proceedings. Once the prisoners are corralled, law enforcement take their places. The loudspeaker crackles with life. 
Citizens of the Phoenix Project, thank you for your time, your patience, your discipline over the past weeks, months. Our skilled, devoted law enforcement division, led by Colonel Dana Marsh, worked with every other Phoenix Project division to investigate conspiracy and alleged terrorism. For too long, those self-identified as dissidents or dissenters against our council, our trustworthy advanced technology, and the central processor have made their hatred of our way of life known. They did this in covert activities, specific crimes. These acts of vandalism, abuse, co-opting and hacking software, and spreading propaganda and resistance threaten the way of life passed down by the founders of the project. Today, we bring an end to that cycle of destruction and... Someone in the crowd leaps up, shouts, Liars! They're innocent! Nearby gendarmes sweep into the crowd, truncheons in hand. It is unclear what happens next, but the point is made. The voice on the loudspeaker continues, highlighting words like solidarity, sacrifice, and solutions. Then, contributions, collaboration, contentment. Miral feels John bristle at each word. The large screens at the rear of the room dissolve from black to the shimmering, amorphous images of the Phoenix Council. Outlines take shape. Shape takes form. Flattened instead of in hologram form, the Council appears lifeless in the odd, lavender color. As usual, it is clear some are male, others female, all of them disguising their identities. But they are not all there. Only eight members appear, representing both judge and jury over the fates of the accused. A disembodied voice echoes throughout the hall, naming specific dissidents, notably Maricela Santiago and Harumi Gale. Then, the charges are read, everything from the exaggerated to the trivial. John sees Dr. Fox roll his eyes. He turns to the psychotherapist. Special how? John asks. Fox gives Bath a confused look. You said the youth was a very, very special patient, Bath reminds him. Oh. Fox's face turns a shade paler. It's confidential, of course. Well, what the hell was a young girl doing at the meeting of the... It's complicated, John, the psychotherapist speaks evenly, cautiously. Maybe when all of this, he nods at the front of the room, is over we can find an excuse to collaborate on her therapy. John shrugs, confused but intrigued. Fox nods, turns back to the proceedings. As crimes are discussed, debated, Maricela Santiago responds assertively. The council speaks over her, debating, disregarding. None of the other accused speak. There is a brief pause in the proceedings. The crowd grumbles. This could go on forever, Bass says to Ganaya. Voices on the loudspeaker resume, now inviting members of the Phoenix Project, the dissident's fellow citizens, to defend or speak on their behalf. A hush falls over the crowd. Bath turns, looks around him slowly, memorizes the faces. No one has the nerve to speak up, to say a damned word, he thinks, to risk anything. He gazes at the accused, sees Harumi's distinct blue hair move, her head and corral turning. He hopes she doesn't see him, as incapable, impotent as the rest. Bath is about to stand when he hears a creaking sound nearby at the end of the bleachers. John and Nero look. The crowd looks. Some see the old man in the wheelchair. Others shuffle to get a glimpse, but their view is obscured. General Benjamin Castro pauses at the end of the aisle, between the bleachers, somewhere in no man's land between the council, the dissidents, and the citizens. Castro carefully grasps the handles of his wheelchair, takes a deep breath, and with a sense of great dignity, pushes himself to his feet. Shaky legs struggle, adjusting to the unaccustomed weight. Benjamin straightens his back, winces with pain. A spotlight descends on the elderly man out of time. Some see his handmade, rough-stitched uniform, 
others do not, but all hear his voice. I've heard enough. General Castro's old voice is surprisingly clear. General, please don't. Danielle Devenu leaves her place in the bleachers, starts in Benjamin's direction. With a simple gesture, Castro waves her away. The determination in his eyes gives the young woman pause. Slowly, Castro walks unassisted to the center of the room. I've heard more than enough, to be frank. I've seen many trials in my life, both just and unjust. I've seen grandstanding, propaganda, spin, and every kind of lie. But I've never been so disgusted with anything as I am this kangaroo court. The general turns his gaze from the screens. The council, however disguised, seems stunned by his rebuke. Benjamin faces the assembly. Have none of you any sense of perspective? Have none of you any appreciation for our situation? He locks eyes with specific audience members, keeping, holding their attention. Here we are, at the end of the world, decades removed from the great fall of civilization, from the moment of mankind's greatest failure. Here we are, encased in an iron tomb below the ruins of history. Above our heads at this very moment, the forgotten survivors of the apocalypse struggle to hold on to life. A life which is near to extinction at the hands of poverty, starvation, plague, and the predations of a race of mutated beast men who believe that they will not succeed unless humanity fails. The audience listens with rapt attention. Dr. Fox leans over to John. Is that... is that General Ben Castro? Bath hesitates, holds his fingers to his lips. I heard a rumor circulating through channels, Fox says. Somebody said Castro was seen in the senior ward. Something about conditions of the Earth's surface. To hear confirmation of the general's exploration, observations, in person, in stark contradiction to what citizens were told, unnerved them angered them. Benjamin continues, You sit there, prattling of the greater good, of your great efforts to preserve the human race, pontificating hypocrites, whitewashed tombs, as a rebellious rabbi once observed of the Pharisees of his day. You present yourselves as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. How does this aid the reconstruction of civilization? Muriel and John squirm, shifting to see the general standing slantways, an accusing hand pointed at the council on the screens. I have seen governments run roughshod over civil liberties in the name of national strength or some greater purpose, but this council does so for nothing. The standard of living in this godforsaken project has decreased even in the short time I have been awake. There are no plans to recolonize the surface, not once. Not once have you brought those of us who have been exploring the surface to consult with you on rebuilding it. Castro turns, sees Danielle standing several feet away at the foot of the stands. Her pale face and trembling lips appeal in a way words cannot. The general allows a reassuring grin. His condemnation is not without purpose, and it is not equal. Exploring the surface, an older man bald and bespectacled calls out from the audience. Castro nods. Indeed. Your council has authorized the remote exploration of the surface of the Earth. This adventure is kept secret from you, from the citizens of the Phoenix Project, for no purpose I can discern. Council members shift, going in and out of focus on the massive screens. The members say nothing. Maricela Santiago eyes fixed on the general, tries to interrupt him. Castro ignores her entirely, speaks over her muffled voice. When I was first revived from stasis, I kept my tongue to myself. I was willing to withhold my judgment of the council's directives until I knew more about the current circumstances. Now that I have seen the insanity of the council's orders firsthand, seen the way you imprison your elderly, seen the way you stifle any dissent in order to maintain your power, I have seen enough. This project exists 
For a reason, Benjamin shakily walks closer to the audience. This project exists to preserve the human race during a time of great crisis, but with the purpose of recolonizing once the crisis has passed. In the stands, Meryl turns, watches John's eyes widen. His pink face shows few signs of the wrinkle she spied earlier. He looks gleeful. How many decades has it been? General Castro continues, now speaking close to the crowd. Each question, each statement seems personal. The Earth's surface is ruined, but it can sustain life. There is no reason you should have been kept here for so long. There is no reason these so-called leaders should be keeping this information from you. They should have planned to return to the surface once the radiation and weapon fog faded. Yet here you are, a half a century later, kept in the dark about the Earth, about your future. I say, no more. The general stumbles. Tired legs begin to give. Danielle steps closer, prepared to help the old man. Or to show her support. Benjamin steals himself, straightens his spine, returns to the center of the room. No more, he says again. I am not a citizen of your project, although I was there at the beginning. I am a relic from an older time, crippled by stasis, and I have no doubt my body's days are numbered. But I will not die a witness to the indefinite imprisonment of humanity in a filthy bunker somewhere beneath a world where other humans need help, when the people of this project could do so much to help if only they had the resolve to do so. In the stands above, John Bath thinks of his father, exiled for giving food to those in need. He recalls stories about his father finding an exit from the underground, a place where humans could throw open a door into sunlight or dark, a place where they, like the general, would reawaken to their destiny. Then, John remembers the pervasive writing, in his own hand, in his journals and notebooks. There is no hatch. How did those words get there? What did they mean? There is nothing you can do to silence me, General Castro grins at the council, who remains silent. Distorted lavender forms shift uncomfortably. There is nothing you can do to control me. I walked back and forth in your project as I have in the world and I intend to tell everyone what I and a select few have seen on the surface. John and Miro look around them, consider the expressions, the reactions of their fellow civilians. Some appear anxious, confused, others afraid, sorrowful, and a few, pleased, hopeful. To silence me, Castro continues, you will have to kill me. But if you do, I would offer you a piece of advice. This will not work. General Castro gestures at the council, then at those in law enforcement standing idly by, unsure of whether they should pounce on the old man or hear him out. None of this will work. Benjamin waves a fist at the dissidents gathered in the dock. His actions both engage and condemn. You can sentence your fellow citizens to the stockade, but you don't have enough room to shelter and feed them all. You can exile them, but you will have to send them all away. You can execute their leadership, but eventually you must kill every man, woman, and child in this chamber. Nearby, Danielle watches, sees the general pause as if gasping for air, hiding this. She wants to move in, to help him, to show she agrees with him, that she stands with him. There will be more dissent, more riots. Benjamin catches his breath, looks directly at Devenu, shakes his head slightly to signal her. Then, he says, there will be revolution. You will radicalize every citizen, and if you kill them all, it will be just this latest iteration of your council. Twelve, or rather eight, all of you alone in this deep, dank bunker. The machinery will fail, piece by piece. Your blessed central processor, like all technology, will die. You will starve, and you will die alone, in the dark. With slow, unsteady steps, the general returns to his wheelchair. His energy is spent, but he feels at peace, more content than every moment since he returned to the surface. 
well, since his simulacrum set foot there. An unexpected hush falls over the room, but it does not last. The audience stirs, then calls out at law enforcement, at the council, one by one. You lied to us! Then, everyone. How dare you! They shout. When will you set us free? When? Gradually, a chant breaks out among the crowd. Dozens, a hundred or more, young and old, cry out in unison. To the surface now! To the surface now! Citizens, families, the ill and hidden, view the broadcast in other parts of the project. In their rooms and hollows, they take up the chant. To the surface now! To the surface now! A piercing whine issues from the loudspeakers. Those in the courtroom clasp hands over ears in pain. The cacophonous alarm gradually fades. It is replaced by a concerted voice from the Phoenix Council responding to the crowd. General Castro, thank you for your feedback. The united voice speaks near monotonously. Thank you for expressing your concerns. The Council sincerely appreciates your input. Then, Council Member One speaks, apart from the rest. Citizens of the Phoenix Project, the Council understands this situation seems unsettling. The Council understands we have perhaps handled matters over the past months in an overly cautious fashion. However, it has never been the intention of this Council to mislead its citizens for selfish or unjustified reasons. The Council asks that you extend us the benefit of the doubt, at least for a few moments, while the Council consult the Central Processor for guidance. The loudspeaker cuts out with a spit of static. Chatter breaks out among the crowd. Voices of dissent rise once again. The loudspeaker reactivates. This time, Council Member 4 speaks with a rattled, throaty voice. Citizens, please, give the Council just a minute. Purple images of the Phoenix Council vanish. Elsewhere, old televisions and view screens dim, then power off. The closed circuit broadcast ends abruptly throughout the project. John and Miral exchange glances. We'd better get out of here, Bath says, then immediately wonders, where will we go? Where are we safe from law enforcement, the inquisition of the council, fellow citizens demanding answers they didn't have? Yes, Mural stands. They walk close together to the end of the raised platform. Mural leads John along the side of the bleachers. At the bottom of wood and metal steps, Danielle stands, arms crossed in front of General Castro. Well, General, Devenu hides the trembling they all perceive. Is it fear or excitement? You've done it. It had to be done. A youthful glow seems to polish Benjamin's wrinkled complexion. As does something else. He turns to Ganaya. Miral, there is something you must know. He reaches out to her, grabs her hand. The look in her eyes, Benjamin thinks. The look I saw before, in her mother's gentle expression. She looks so much like her mother. So much. I don't think my speech will be well received, Benjamin turns, says to the group. He fixes his gaze on Meryl. I think my time with you may very well be limited. You should know that. He pauses, longing to reveal the truth. He is her father. But, here at the moment of revelation, he halts himself. What will this accomplish, other than to soothe my own sense of guilt? Will this satisfy her longing for resolution? Will knowing how his love affair with Meryl's mother began and ended bring the doctor peace? No, the general thinks. He sighs deeply, realizing his desire is self-serving. You're the finest doctor I have ever known. You have given me hope that if a partisan such as I can appreciate a Persian such as yourself, surely anyone can overcome bias in the name of human decency. Meryl gazes into Castro's cloudy blue eyes. It is an odd comment, she thinks. She is unsure exactly how to interpret the old man's words. Is he overwhelmed by the situation? I'm glad to have been your doctor, General, Meryl says. And 
I'm so sorry I didn't do a better job with... She gestures at his legs. The general nods proudly, removes his hands from hers. So, what the hell do we do now? Bath interjects. He glances around the hall, at angry citizens in the stands, law enforcement on guard nearby, probably wondering how to contain the massive crowd. I'll be removed as project administrator, Daniel states. With a crackle of static, the loudspeakers reactivate. One after the other, the vague images of the eight council members appear. The council directly addresses the seated general. Council member number one delivers the response. General Benjamin Castro, the central processor reviewed your testimony. You are a skilled orator, a career diplomat, a talented soldier, and a political leader. Elements of what you said represent kernels of truth, but your diatribe was not given in good faith. The central processor has informed us that your intent is to turn the populace against the leadership of the Phoenix Project so that you can execute a coup to return yourself to temporal power and use the project to rebuild the nation of Israel. General Castro's full-throated, unamplified laugh is heard throughout the hall. Law enforcement volunteers, led by Corporal Reed, encroach on General Castro and the others. Reed places a hand on the general's wheelchair. Wait, don't do this! Miro pushes, tries intervening between the standing corporal and seated general. Armored volunteers hold her back, pushing her into the bleachers. Hey, get your hands off her! Bath leaps forward, his angular jaw aimed at the officers. Subdue him, Reed orders. Volunteers crowd Miro and Castro, grapple Bath. In an uncharacteristic display of anger and force, John bashes his forehead into Corporal Reed's face. Fascist pig! A loud crack rips through the throng. Reed stumbles to one knee. Blood seethes from both nostrils. The crowd shifts in the bleachers. Spectators gather, watching the scene below them. Citizens, please listen. The council vainly tries to calm the project. What you heard are half-truths and demagoguery. It is true your council is probing the service, but the results are inconclusive. Danielle reaches down to Mural grasps her forearm, pulls her up. Get him out of here, she nods at General Castro. Elitist bastard, Corporal Reed stands, commands the volunteers again. Hold him. John struggles against those before and behind him. A thin line of blood drips between his eyes. The council continues speaking, but few are listening. As soon as we have a complete understanding of the situation, the central processor will evaluate our plans. In the meantime, we must persevere as we have, and we must restore a sense of normalcy. Mural grips the back of Benjamin's wheelchair, pulls it swiftly, retreating down the long aisle away from Reed, Bath, and Devenu. Reed ignores them. His attention is fixed on Bath. Throw him down, he instructs the armored men holding John. Throw him down, he says again. The volunteers do as they are told. John falls to his hands and knees. John! Devenu moves closer, looks up at Corporal Reed. Stop this! Damn you, stop this! Please return to your domiciles immediately. The project is on temporary lockdown. Citizens crowd Reed, Bath, and Devenu, watching, waiting to see what the law enforcement officer and volunteers will do. You deserve this. Reed draws his truncheon, brings it down swiftly on Bath's head, his neck, his shoulders. The academic cries out in pain, falls, pushes himself up, looks at Danielle, feels the stick hit his kidneys. He shakes his head as much as he can. Danielle follows Bath's gaze to Reed's sidearm. Bath hits the floor hard. Danielle reaches between two volunteer law enforcement officers, feels her hand on the grip of the corporal's weapon. She draws it, slides back. Stupid little girl, Reed stops hitting John. You don't know how to use. Danielle grits her teeth. Without hesitation, she pulls the trigger. A bolt fires from the square pistol. A burst of electricity lights up Reed's neck and shoulder. The corporal writhes in pain, falls to the floor, shuddering. Without looking down, Danielle grabs Bath's collar. He is too heavy for her to carry or drag. Come on, she implores. You've got to move. Now. John groans, crawls 
pushes himself to a standing position. He leans on Devenu, shakily, holds his sides. Everything hurts. Devenu and Bath back away down the aisle. The weapon waves steadily in the air between them and the volunteers trying to contain them. Don't do anything stupid, one of the volunteers says, hands raised. Too late for that, Daniel responds and pushes John through the exit. Reed stumbles to his feet, staggers. Before he or the volunteers can overcome Devenu, unarmed citizens advance, overcome them. Spectators leap from the stands, topple the volunteers. Please, the council asks that no one resist or attempt to violate our orders. Law enforcement will be forced to intervene. The holograms flicker out of view. One remains, lingering longer than the others. Council member number seven. Further statements and citizen briefings will be issued shortly, he says, then disappears. Danielle pushes the weapon into her waistband, plunges through the exit. As they hustle to the laboratory, security robots and law enforcement move towards the assembly hall. All around Amiral and Benjamin, John and Danielle, citizens are rushed back to their rooms. Some resist, most comply. Confused faces show discontent with the council's explanation. Miral, Benjamin, John, and Danielle meet outside the lab. My God! Miral leaves the general's side to tend to bath. What happened? She looks down, sees the weapon in the project administrator's waistband. The council will try to shut us down, Danielle says, or at least shut down the power to the... The lab doors open. Instinctively, Danielle draws the weapon. I hope that's not for me, Donna Chang says, standing near the archway. Her usual lab coat is gone. She wears a black tank top. Oil and grease stains dot her head, neck, and palms. I saw it all on closed circuit, the engineer says. Don't worry, we'll be safe here. Safe? Benjamin looks at Dr. Bath, a hint of sarcasm in his growl. Come on, Danielle pushes Castro's wheelchair into the laboratory. John throws his arm around Miral's shoulder. She eases him into the room. Careful. Ganaya helps John up onto the metal conference table. Bath lies down, moans in pain. They can't shut us down, Donna says. She walks to the center of the room, to the wall of machines. They can try, but they won't be successful. She gazes up at the humming, reinforced power conduits. Not for a while, anyway. Danielle pushes Castro to the row of porcelainization coffins. In any event, she says, we need to be ready. And we need to find Cuddy. Aftermath, a Fire Pit Creative Group production, based on a story created by Rhett Davis, with characters created by Rhett Davis, Warren Davis, Willem DeGrieff, and Cole Hoopengarner. Written by Warren Davis, and edited by Cole Hoopengarner. Castro's monologue in this episode was written by Willem DeGrieff. Narrated and produced by Cole Hoopengarner. Music by Warren Davis, and video production by Willem DeGrieff. The sound effects used in the production of Aftermath are used with permission by the creators, and links to these sound effects can be found in the description section of each episode. Please visit our website, aftermathpodcast.net, for updates, original artwork and music, character dossiers, and more. You can also find us on social media, on Instagram at Fire Pit Creative Group Official, on Twitter at Group Fire Pit, on Facebook at facebook.com slash firepitcreativegroup, and on YouTube at Fire Pit Creative Group. Aftermath and its story, characters, music, and artwork are copyrighted by Fire Pit Creative Group.
Armed guards march Octavia outside City Hall. Still bound, she looks back, sees Hoffa, some of the odd fellows standing on the steps of City Hall, watching. Turn around, bitch. One of the female guards pushes Octavia. It's late in the day, not yet night. Deep gray clouds hover overhead. Thunder booms, rattles the city. Bad weather, Octavia speaks to herself. They walk near the metal fence. Octavia spies the sentries patrolling outside wound razor wire. Will they shoot me down? After all this, will Hoffa let me go just to kill me? No, she thinks. That isn't his way. Hoffa is theatrical, but he's honest. You want to open the gate for me? Octavia asks the guards, or you expect me to climb over? Take your pick, one of the women shoots back. She gestures at the barbs and snares. Octavia glares, walks to the nearby gate. Her escorts follow. Open this damn thing, she commands, and get these ropes off me. One guard unlatches the interior lock, draws it back, opens the gate. Octavia walks through. She turns her back to the women, elevates her wrists behind her. You should have thought about the oath you took, one woman says. She cuts through the rope binding Octavia, touches the side of Octavia's shorn head, the mark of the odd fellows scarred into her brown skin. Maybe, Octavia says. That mark will confer no more privileges or honors, the guard close to Octavia says. You know, we looked up to you, the first woman adds. If I were you, I'd burn that thing off. And don't show your face around here, ever again. Octavia turns slightly, then feels the woman's spit hit just below her collarbones. She shifts aggressively, holds both arms out. She could disarm them both, but there was no point. They're just taunting her, looking for some reason to spill blood. Instead, Octavia raises her head, clenches her teeth, walks from City Hall. She passes between the sentries, walking unafraid beyond the perimeter. She runs a few blocks down Chambers Street. Spatters of lightning fill black clouds. Then comes the rain. Puddles form in potholes, pits. Octavia passes between heaps of rock and glass to Church Street. There, she descends into the subway system. She shakes the rain from her. In the long, dim tunnel, she gets her bearings, remembers where the caged hollow was that General Castro and his fellow explorers stored their robotic bodies. Octavia cautiously navigates the tunnel. She approaches the darkened enclosure, feels the iron bars, makes out the broken, destroyed lock in the dark, pulls back the gate. General? Octavia is unsure why she says this, what she expected. Her sense of touch guides her. And then, Octavia realizes, they are gone. General Castro, McGillicuddy, Dr. Bath, the robots are gone.